Well, welcome to 10 Minute Record Reviews, episode 378. And this episode is the second in the new series 520. And again, the idea of this series is to offer some ideas to beginning collectors about picking up some undervalued jazz. Jazz that doesn't get all the headlines, maybe wasn't released on the biggest labels, but from the classic period of modern jazz, which I'm arbitrarily defining as starting in the 12 inch period in 1955, going to somewhere in the early mid 1970s. I'm finding this series has given me a little bit of anxiety because I will be under constant pressure to produce material, which means I have to keep finding bargains. This is where my Scottish heritage comes into play. But I think I've done okay this month. And again, we're talking about classic pressings that are available for not too much money. And by that, I mean, you're talking about an early pressing. So from typically the first year of release, you're talking about pressings which are very good plus or better on Discogs, and that there should be at least three of those available for under $20 US to qualify for discussion on this series. Now, with all that administration out of the way, let's get going. And so the first record I'd like to talk about is from 1955 on Bethlehem Records, and it's this one. This is Chris. And the first thing to note about this record is that this is the album which basically saved Bethlehem Records from going under and therefore enabling it to put out all the great jazz which it put out in the later 1950s. This is the record which basically kept them afloat. It's also the record which launches Creed Taylor's career as a producer. And so for both those reasons, Bethlehem printed a lot of copies of this record, but that's a good thing because it's a great LP and it's available for not too much. The story behind this record is that Chris Connor, whose name is not actually Chris Connor, but Mary Jean Lutzenheiser, had been singing with the Claude Thornhill Orchestra in the late 40s and early 1950s, but in the mid-50s, her career was kind of drifting. She'd signed to Bethlehem, which was basically a pop label at that point, and they were recording her and marketing her as a pop artist, and it was going nowhere. Creed Taylor, who really didn't have much of a career in the music business at all, had just arrived in New York out of the Army, basically cold calls Gus Bildy and says, look, why a recording this great jazz star as a pop star, that's going nowhere. Hire me, bring me in, I'll produce her, I'll make some jazz records that are gonna sell. Vildi agrees, Taylor comes in, he records Chris Condor, they make several albums, and basically the rest is history. She goes on to great things, both with Bethlehem and then with Atlantic in the 1960s, and Taylor, of course, goes on to be one of the most important figures in jazz in the late 20th century. This record doesn't necessarily capture all of the magic of these two artists in one package, but there's enough here to give you a real taste of their talent. Next record I want to talk about, I've actually mentioned before in this channel, but I want to go into a little greater depth here. And it's this record by Quincy Jones called Go West Man. Now, Quincy Jones was a young man in a hurry in the 1950s. He would cut his jazz teeth playing with Lionel Hampton in the early 1950s, but then he left Hampton, he'd gone to New York, he was working for NBC TV, but he was also ingratiating himself with the record industry and the music industry and the TV industry and everybody because he had a winning personality, because he had buckets of talent. Not only was he a good musician, but he was an even better arranger and a band leader, and he was enormously charismatic. And so great things start to happen to Quincy almost immediately after he arrives in New York. He hooks up with the guys from ABC Paramount who are trying to expand into jazz at this point. He records a whole bunch of tracks with ABC in New York in September 1956, which goes really well. But of course, because of the Paramount linkage, they had a big presence in LA. So they said, you have to go out to LA and do some more tracks in the new year with some West Coast stars, which is exactly what he does. And so in February 1956, Quincy goes out to LA and he makes a record with basically the cream of the talent that was available in West Coast jazz. Just some of the names here, Shelly Mann, Buddy Collette, Bill Perkins, Red Mitchell, incredible bass player, Leroy Vinegar, another incredible bass player, Lou Levy, Benny Carter, Herb Geller, the great sax player, Art Pepper, the alto sax player, really par excellence after, after uh, Bird Parker, Pepper Adams, Conti Candoli, Jack Sheldon. The talent here, if you know anything about West Coast jazz, is just phenomenal. So from these two sessions, he actually releases two LPs on ABC Paramount. The first is largely the New York tracks, and a few of the LA tracks, and that's called This Is How I Feel About Jazz. And this record, Go West Man, is made exclusively from the rest of the LA material. This record tells us tons about Quincy's skills as a musician and as an arranger. This is no blowing session. There are meticulous arrangements here, especially the medley on side two, but that doesn't mean they're stodgy. It's a Quincy Jones record, so it's inherently accessible. His records are always fun. All the compositions, suitably, are by West Coast composers, 
I would recommend this record particularly for people who like a little bit of big band in their cocktail. But in general, I would say, again, it's accessible for everyone. Recommend it. Next record I want to talk about, I have also mentioned before, but very, very briefly, I brought it up the other day when I was talking about Mercury and Embassy Records. And it's this record by Eddie Shambly called Shambly Music. I guess there's a pun in there somewhere. Anyway, Eddie Shambly is a guy who basically had a rock solid R&B background, born in 1920 and really in the 1940s and the early 1950s, he basically carves out a career for himself as an R&B tenor sax player. He doesn't make a serious foray into jazz until 1955 when he joins Lionel Hampton's group, where I presume he met Quincy Jones, who stayed with Hampton until 1956. Anyway, after Hampton, Shambly then goes on to record with Dinah Washington as part of her backing group, and she was recording for Mercury and for Emerson, and I have to imagine that it was that connection which leads to this recording date for Emerson. It's squarely in the bluesy soul jazz lane, somewhere between R&B and hard bop. It's a very fun, supremely listenable record. It's beautifully produced and beautifully arranged. He's working in a nonette here, and the other player who really stands out is on trumpet, and that's Johnny Coles. Next, I want to talk about a record by Ray Charles. Now, Ray Charles, of course, is known as a singer. He's known for his great R&B hits. He's known for his treatment of the standards in the Great American Songbook later in his career, and at that time, too, some great duets that he did. But what is sometimes less appreciated about Ray is that he was a serious jazz musician and worked very much as a jazz musician during important periods of his career. And this is an example of this. It's called The Genius After Hours. It came out on Atlantic. And this presents Charles in a trio setting, in a quintet setting, I think in a larger setting as well. Uh, somebody else who regularly appears on here was his regular sax player, Dave Fathead Newman. And again, this is recorded after he's become a household name and a phenomenon with his late 1950s tracks for Atlantic, things like What I Say and Nighttime is the Right Time. Here he is a couple of years later playing serious jazz for serious people. It is a beautiful soul jazz set. And if what you want is the low-key touch of the master, then this record is for you. Last but not least, I'd like to talk about a record by a guy who is really not as well known as he ought to be given the sheer number of recording credits that he has, and that is Red Calendar. And this is Red Calendar's record from 1956, which came out simultaneously on Modern Records and also Modern Records' budget imprint Crown. This is the Crown version. It's called Swinging Sweet. And Red Calendar is probably the archetype of the West Coast jazz musician, great jazz musician, who never really got the opportunities or the profile that he might have done largely for racial reasons. As I mentioned, he's not much discussed these days. As I say, he has over a thousand recording credits. Most of those are on bass, although he also recorded reasonably prolifically on the jazz tuba, and he actually leads at least one record. I've got one, there may be others, with the tuba as a lead instrument. And despite those thousand credits, this is one of his very few, I think, three or four records from the 50s and 60s with him as an outright leader as opposed to part of a collective. It is absolutely worth seeking out. My copy used to belong, I love this kind of stuff, there it is, if you can see that, to a guy called Albert Kisseloff, St. Albans, New York. So I couldn't resist looking him up whenever I find more of those stamps. Turns out Mr. Kisseloff was a high school principal in Brooklyn at a time when communities were trying to take control over the local curriculum, and he was central to that, and that leads to some massive New York teacher strike, apparently the biggest teacher strike that ever existed in New York, which unfortunately had a lot of racial undertones or overtones as well. Anyway, Mr. Kisseloff was one of the good guys, and I feel pretty honored actually to have his record. The music on here is really good. It's swinging jazz with kind of a mid-sized group. I think it's an octet, uh, something like that. Anyway, it's got the great Buddy Collette on tenor sax. You can get this cheap like Borscht, but I do recommend getting the Modern Records version as opposed to the Crown Records version because Crown was one of those West Coast labels, budget labels, that use recycled vinyl, and the surface noise on this, which is otherwise a pretty clean record, is something to behold. So there we have it, five records for under $20, all of which are, in my view, excellent quality jazz from the classic period, all of which you should be able to pick up for not too much money, so happy hunting, and if you have any suggestions or comments, please do put them in the section below, and thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.